So welcome everybody uh, to the seventh series of, of, of our webinar series on building community capacity. Um, this will be getting towards the end of our summer series of, of, of webinars. And so thank you for those who have joined us for the previous ones and thank you for all joining today. I'm gonna give a few seconds just to let the, the audience kind of fill in, I'll let the lobby fill in. Um, but today we're going to be speaking about how culture matters, uh, creating culturally responsive evidence-based programs. This is the webinar you signed into, you are in the right place. Um, my name is Daniel Pagan, and leading this discussion today will be Marcea Hortado Gomez. Um, I'm just wait a few, little bit more while people kind of come in. Um, but while people are kind of coming into these, the webinar, I just want to go over a few housekeeping details um, for anybody not familiar with GoToMeeting. Uh, so you have your meeting manager on the side and everyone is muted, but we will be uh, taking questions and you can submit your questions in the question panel box. And please do that anytime throughout the webinar. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, our colleague, Avalyn Heltzel, is also standing by to help you, and her email is right at the bottom. Uh, please use that if you're having any technical difficulties, audio, uh, or anything else. And the webinar is being recorded, and we will be sharing this back to everybody. Um, you should get an email, at least by tomorrow, uh, with the recording. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is that in the handout section of your, of your manager, uh, we have the bios of the panelists, who are all joining us from Identity Inc. today, and as well as the, the PowerPoint slides if you wanna kind of follow along. Those are only available during the, uh, during the webinar. So if you want to download them now or save them to your own computer, please feel free to do so. Okay, okay. so I mentioned before, uh, my name is Daniel Pagan, Senior Analyst at Community Science. I'm joined by Marcea Hortado Gomez, Managing Associate, also from Community Science. And I'd like to kind of get a sense of who here is in the audience, who's joining us today, and, and you know, what, what, what role do you all uh, fulfill in your professional lives? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start this poll here. If everybody wouldn't mind just taking the next few seconds to kind of pick and choose the category that best fits for you. Um, we'll kind of see who's in the audience today and get a, get a sense. Um, so far we have about 129 um, people joining in. So welcome everybody again, if you're coming in late. Uh, you are muted, but please do submit your questions throughout the webinar in the questions panel, uh, and I'll be responding to those. And we will take time at the end of the webinar to address um, what questions we, we can. So. Okay, get a little bit more time for people to fill in and uh, pick the response that best fits for, for yourself. Okay. So looks like um, today we're joined by a pretty big crowd of, of academics, uh, evaluators or other researchers, so welcome. Uh, as well as other community nonprofits and, and from government agencies. So that's good to see. Um, welcome everyone. And we, we hope that this webinar gives you a bit more information around uh, evidence-based programs as well as adapting them. Okay. With that, I want to uh, kick it off to Marcea. Thanks, Daniel. So um, I first want to walk through how we'll be spending our time together today. Um, just wanting to note that this really isn't going to be a lecture, um, but rather it's a dialogue with our panelists. Um, so we'll begin by welcoming our panel members. Um, then I'll take about 10 minutes to provide some background informational slides that'll help really just contextualize the conversation for us. And then I'll invite our panel members to introduce themselves and their organization um, but really most of our time today is gonna to be spent in conversation with the panel um, so that we can learn about their experiences in implementing evidence-based programs with, 
Latino immigrant families, and then how they came to develop their own program to address an unmet need. And um, as Daniel said, we'll conclude with answering what questions we can from you all, our listeners. Um, so first, let me begin by welcoming all of you on the call today, but I also want to welcome um, especially our panel members. So welcome, bienvenidos. And wanting to say here that while all of us on the panel are bilingual, um, some may feel more comfortable speaking in Spanish. And so I've given them the option to speak in Spanish if that's more comfortable. And so in that case, you'll be hearing from our interpreter, uh, Kathy Ogle, who is not on camera right now, but she is online with us um, during the course of this webinar. So right now I'll do a quick introduction of, of who's on my panel um, and then later have them introduce themselves um, in just a few minutes after I go through those context slides. So our guests today are all um, from Identity Inc., which is a community-based nonprofit organization located here in Maryland um, that serves Latino youth and their families. So with us today is uh, Diego Uriburu, the co-founder and executive director, Carolina Camacho, program director and part of the leadership team, Tomas Rodriguez, a program coordinator and lead facilitator of the Family Reunification Program, and Ligia Gomez, a case manager and co-facilitator of that same program. And I wanna also just say a little bit more about myself and my background in this topic. Um, so I have both direct practice experience in implementing evidence-based programs with ethnically diverse families, um, but I also have experience conducting research in this area. So I feel like that through this combined experience, um, I still continue to see a disconnect between research and practice, especially in terms of having culturally responsive evidence-based programs. Um, also in sort of having a consensus or what constitutes evidence, and also in just the evaluation methods um, that are used when evaluating practice-based programs. So those are some of the things that I bring to this conversation, both from practice and from experience. And so when I talk about evidence-based practice, what I mean is, um, you know, those programs that have consistently been shown to be effective over time um, in multiple outcome studies, right? So in other words, they have um, the, the more traditional scientific evidence to demonstrate their effectiveness. Um, and as a result of this, then they become identified as best practices, right? Which grabs the attention of funders um, but also from organizations who are looking for interventions to address the needs of their communities. Um, so through their positive reputation, and also sometimes they're being listed on national registries of evidence-based programs, so they do get widely used and disseminated broadly. Right? Evidence-based programs are structured, um, so they often include a set of instructions and resource materials which is really an asset, especially to folks in the field who are really busy because it allows them to have a, you know, a service that they can provide quickly to um, a lot of the people that they serve, as opposed to trying to develop a program from scratch, which can be very labor intensive. So, um, you know, and oftentimes it, these programs come with validated instruments that can also be quickly um, used for internal evaluation purposes, so that makes them attractive as well. Um, many evidence-based programs have uh, also versions that have been culturally adapted and validated as um, effective with the population they've been adapted for, so that's also a very positive thing. However, <laughs> There are also questions and concerns that come up um, about the relevance of evidence-based programs, um, such that some people feel that, like, while a program sounds good on paper, looks good, right, on paper, um, it doesn't always work well in practice, right? So it can feel like a very top-down approach with these models. Um, 
And sometimes the programs seem too structured in that they don't really lend themselves to making adaptations to fit a particular audience. So, and then there's also some pushback on what gets labeled as rigorous scientific evidence. So terms like evidence, terms like evaluation, can have negative connotations to practitioners um, and recipients of services as well because they have been or can be used as tools of oppression. Um, so I just raise that to say that it's really important to recognize this dynamic and for us to value also lived experience and other ways of knowing as well. Um, other evidence-based uh, programs, even those that have been culturally adapted, may also often require even more adaptations um, based on you know, the, the folks that you're working with. And as you know, is well known, and you, you may even hear today that even within a ethnically you know, within an ethnic group, there's also a lot of diversity within that group itself too. So adaptation can happen um, in two main ways that I wanna talk about. Um, so the varying degrees of cultural adaptations, um, most of them are surface structure adaptations. Um, so by that, I'm referring to those that, those adaptations that are really observable superficial uh, material things. So for example, um, direct translations of program materials into another language. Um, or if the program has you know, accompanying videos, sometimes they'll have actors on those videos that represent the cultural group or include music um, and food from the culture. Um, and while all of these adaptations are good and, and helpful, um, you know, it doesn't get to that deeper level. So when I talk about deep structure adaptations, I'm referring to those cultural, social, historical, environmental, and psychological influences on behavior, okay? So to get at that, you really need to ensure that the underlying theory and the methodology of the program itself is in alignment with the culture of the the people that you're working with. Um, so it, it just brings me back, to, I'll provide an example. Um, when I was doing some interviews with program facilitators of this well-known reputable family intervention program um, that had been culturally adapted by the developers themselves, right? So it, it was well-known to be um, useful for a uh, diverse audience. Um, so when I was interviewing those folks, they all mentioned, you know, that those adaptations just weren't really enough and really weren't resonating with their, the families they were working with. And so they described a whole host of different ways that, um, that they had to adapt the program to meet the needs of their families. So that's just highlighting one example. So the other point I wanted to make here is that adaptations then you know, depending the degree to what the to the uh, adaptations are made, then it's going to be impacting program fidelity or how closely a program is implemented as it was intended, right? So this raises this issue about like how much can an evidence-based program be adapted before it becomes too different than the original model? Um, because then we get into issues about it begins to compromise the integrity of the original research that was done um, for that evidence base. Um, you know, a lot of there's a lot of studies out there that that talk about this issue and note that there really are very few programs that are implemented with um, fidelity. So, the the other thing within the literature that that is a potential solution to this is for programs to to really just identify what are those core components, those core elements that must be adhered to, and then allow for other aspects of the program to be adapted. So, you know, and sometimes evidence-based practices aren't gonna be enough. So we, we have um, this opportunity 
really to elevate the use of practice-based programs um, or promising practices as they're sometimes referred to. So what I mean by that is programs that um, practitioners have des designed um, based on an unmet need that, and, it, and the key here is that these programs typically place culturally specific values, beliefs, and socio-historical perspectives at the center of the program, and that's the key. Uh, these programs tend to demonstrate um, practice-based or community-defined evidence, um, but that often have not been subjected to the more traditional definitions of empirical evaluation. And so while, you know, this makes them ideal for use with that specific population that they were developed for, you know, if they're not able to build the strong evidence base uh, behind them, then it's really going to make it challenging for these programs to become well known, to be adopted, to be disseminated, um, especially in comparison to evidence based programs. So, with that context, um, uh, I now want to invite our panelists um, to introduce themselves. Uh, the, their role within the organization, and a little bit about what they're bringing to today's conversation. So um, I'll begin with Diego uh, for introduction. Thank you very much, Marcella, and thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. My name is Diego Uriburu, and I'm the proud co-founder and executive director of Identity. We are a soon to be 23 year old organization we have a budget of around 6.5 million dollars we employ 70 plus individuals we focused on three main areas uh, within the latino community uh, the social and emotional uh, supports educational supports and workforce and employment services um, we work with, uh, we serve around 17,000 individuals per year, or around 3,500 families. Uh, we we work with uh, uh, children in elementary school, middle school, high school. We have two centers for disconnected youth, and we also have programs at the correctional facility. All of those programs are supported by wraparound services, such as case management, mental health, recreation, uh, advocacy is a big part of what we do also. Um, one of our values and the value that I, I connect with the most is that to serve others is a privilege and it requires excellence. And that value has guided our work from the very beginning. And so maybe 17 years ago or 20 years ago, we, conducted the first ever needs assessment of Latino youth in Montgomery County, Maryland. We, <clears throat> there was no data about this population, no data whatsoever. And uh, so we surveyed around a thousand young people. We also conducted key format interviews with people who, who knew the community. We conducted focus group with parents. We also did a survey with nonprofits to see who was doing what and how many were serving this community, etc. And we gathered a lot of data. But the most important data, two two most important data points. One was that Montgomery County, uh, though it had exploded with this population, uh, it was not really providing services, no, in terms of youth development services or. or support for parents, etc. And then we got a lot of data about the needs and assets of our young people. And we really, really wanted to, to create a program or to, or to uh, implement a program that would really meet their needs. So we went on to look at what I think then they were called model programs. And, uh, and SAMHSA and the CDC and others had a list of model programs. So we, we purchased many of those to look at what they had. And then we asked how many of those were evaluated with Latinos? And of the 20 something programs that we looked at, only, only seven or so were, 
were evaluated with the Latino population. The problem was, as Marseilla um, talked about earlier in the presentation, they were really evaluated with populations that did not compare, whose needs did not compare the needs of the Central American population that were fleeing a civil war at the time. So, for example, a program was evaluated in, in Miami with the Cuban community, which is very different than, than ours. Uh, also in, in Boston with the Dominican community, which is also very different, or in Florida, sorry, in, um, in California. So, so we were left uh, with, a, with alternative of using something that we believe would not meet the needs of our communities, or to develop our own programming. And that's what we did. And that was 20 something years ago, maybe 20, 21 years ago. And, and today, when we find programs that we can really adapt uh, and use them, we, we do, and we've done it a few times. Um, but we also have been uh, developing expertise to develop our own programs. And then we, I just want to clarify that we just don't develop them and, and we go. We, we test it with the community, then we pilot test it, we cognitive test them, uh, we evaluate them. Uh, only one time or twice we used uh, what uh, evaluators called the quasi-experimental design, where we had control groups, with massive amount of young people. Uh, but that is very, very expensive and it makes it very difficult for us to do. So what we do is we have our own evaluation and we try to improve upon things when uh, every year based on the results, based on the feedback of the community. And it has proven to work very, very, very well for us. So I'll stop there. So thank you. So uh, I'll go next then. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here, Marseille. I'm Carolina Camacho and I'm uh, one of the program directors at Identity. Uh, my uh, area of responsibility are our um, school-based uh, health and wellness centers at three high schools in Montgomery County, as well as our family reunification and strengthening program. And um, as Diego has shared with you, uh, Identity has over 22 years of experience developing uh, culturally competent, trauma-informed prevention, intervention, and reunification programs and services that uh, strengthen the social emotional well-being and, um, and provide academic support um, and, and support the academic and economic uh, achievement of the youth that we serve. And um, as Diego alluded to, from the very beginning, identity has always had a dual generation approach. And um, a key um, to our, uh, our success has been um, to meet our youth and families where they are and listen to them. And as Diego mentioned, using focus groups, needs assessments, and then we also have youth and parent advisory boards so that we're really able to um, uh, provide programs and services that most meet, meet the needs of, of, uh, of the youth and families that we serve. And again, from the very beginning, evaluation has been a key component, um, a pillar of, of identity's work. And um, we'll be talking today in particular um, about our approach um, using baseline exit and satisfaction surveys to really um, analyze the impact of our programs um, and, and over the course of the youth and their parents' participation, and also to always, um, you know, have our, our finger on the pulse of the emerging needs of our clients and so that we're able to provide programs and services that most meet their needs. Today in particular, we're going to be sharing uh, about our family reunification program, and it's a great pleasure to have our family reunification team joining us today. Tomas? Eh, buenos días, mi nombre es Tomás Rodríguez, soy el facilitador líder y coordinador del programa. Hello, my name is Tomás Rodríguez. I'm the lead facilitator and program coordinator. El objetivo del programa de reunificación familiar es proporcionar servicios de reunificación familiar basados en la cultura de los miembros de la familia latina que enfrentan los desafíos de reparar sus relaciones después de un periodo prolongado de separación. The objective of the Family Reunification Program is to reach out to families uh, through culturally relevant programs um, and to repair the relationships that have been broken during the period of migration. Este programa incluye talleres, workshops, eh, 
también incluir eh, coaching session y ahora en el tiempo de COVID tenemos sesiones virtuales con la familia a través de la línea telefónica. The program includes workshops, it includes uh, coaching sessions, and it also now in the period of COVID, we are having virtual sessions where we can connect with people by phone. Y además en estos tiempos de, eh, estamos eh, facilitando acceso a servicios integrales de apoyo social para satisfacer las necesidades de los participantes y poder tener acceso a los recursos del condado. We're also helping to provide access to wraparound social services to meet the needs of the families and connect them with relevant county agencies. El programa eh, persigue cinco objetivos. Establecer y restablecer las relaciones positivas entre padres e hijos. The program has five objectives. The first is to establish or reestablish positive parent-child relationships. Desarrollar habilidades entre los miembros de la familia para desarrollar comunicaciones efectivas. The second is to build skills among family members in order to develop effective communication. Restaurar la autoridad paterna. Restore parental authority. Aplicar técnicas para lidiar con el estrés. Apply techniques to cope with stress. E incorporar tradiciones y valores culturales para fortalecer los lazos familiares. And incorporate cultural traditions and values to strengthen family bonds. El núcleo del programa son seis sesiones de talleres de trabajo. The main part of the program is six sessions of workshops. Este, las tres primeras eh, brindan actividades que dan la oportunidad de que las familias reflexionen acerca de su vida y su pasado. The first three sessions give an opportunity to families to reflect about their lives and their past. Y las últimas tres sesiones tratan de dar herramientas para poder responder a los problemas identificados en las tres primeras sesiones. And the second, sorry, the, yeah, the second three sessions uh, are to provide tools to help families respond to the problems that were identified during the first three sessions. Luego tenemos un sistema de evaluación que trata de medir los cambios en el conocimiento, las actitudes y los comportamientos. Our evaluation measures the program impact on knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. Eh, se administran encuestas de entrada y de salida, y también se tienen eh, métodos cualitativos de los cuales Ligia les hablará a continuación. We do a baseline survey at the beginning, we also do an exit survey, and we also use qualitative methods that Ligia will talk about. Hola, buenos medios días. Eh, mi, nombre es, mi nombre es Ligia Gómez, eh, soy facilitadora del programa de reunificación familiar. My name is Ligia Gómez and I'm a facilitator for the Family Reunification Program. Y me da mucho gusto compartir con ustedes eh, cómo trabajamos el sistema de monitoreo y evaluación. I'm very happy to share with you today how we work on the monitoring and evaluation system. Nosotros hacemos una combinación de instrumentos cualitativos y cuantitativos. We use a combination of qualitative and quantitative uh, instruments. Esto nos ha permitido tener resultados prometedores en el programa de reunificación familiar. And that has allowed us to have some promising results in the family reunification program. Lo tenemos que comprender como un proceso de aprendizaje continuo. We are helping people to understand through a continuing learning process. Logrando la adaptación a las necesidades de los participantes en el proceso de reunificación familiar. And we're adapting our program to the needs of the participants in the process of family reunification. Esto es posible por la, la flexibilidad de los métodos cualitativos que se complementa con la robustez de los métodos cuantitativos. That is possible because of the flexibility of the qualitative methods along with the robustness of the quantitative methods. 
Gracias. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, and welcome again, everyone. Um, thank you, Kathy, for being here to interpret for us. Um, so I want to move us into now the discussion um, of our the discussion portion of our uh, webinar. And I feel like Diego has started to answer this first question already, which is what has been identities experience um, implementing evidence-based programs um, that are culturally appropriate and effective for the families you serve. Uh, so we heard, you know, from Diego, but definitely opening it up to the panel. Uh, anything right. to add here? I can add a, a few more details to um, for what Diego shared. Um, with regards to um, implementing existing evidence-based programs, uh, so what what we found um, was that um, in, in two uh, cases several years ago, uh, was um, our approach was you know first to attend the training uh, for the program, but then before implementing, uh, we did focus groups with our target audience and um, and as well as with our facilitators, so that we were able to get feedback before actually implementing the program, like uh, with a pilot group to 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 um, understand what their um, response would be to the activities. And then, you know, we were um, meticulous about, um, about um, you know, keeping track of the um, adaptations that we wanted to make and we requested permission from our contract monitor um, in order to adapt the particular curriculum so that it would meet the needs of the population that we served, not changing the core elements, but um, uh, you know, and, and providing uh, data, focus group data, et cetera, to, um, to um, uh, you know, provide support for the changes and we received approval. So um, you know, some tips that we would wanna share with your audience um, when you are uh, using evidence-based programs and you wanna adapt them to your target uh, population is that you do uh, um, something like this, uh, test it, pilot test it, do interviews, but also that you document the changes that you made. And um, I would say another um, important um, component to making sure that um, a, a program is uh, culturally um, appropriate is to, um, in, in, at least in identities um, experience, our, the key to our success has been that our facilitators are uh, culturally competent, bilingual, um, and they understand the immigration experience. Maybe they themselves oftentimes are immigrants or children of immigrants, um, and um, and as Diego said, our our approach, our our strengths-based approach, using the positive youth development model and providing wraparound services and um, access to services um, that uh, meet the needs of of the population, our predominantly Central American population that we serve here in the um, DMV. So I'll just quickly add that our experience has been mixed. Now, when when the program when the, when you implement an evidence-based program which is culturally competent and and meets the needs, it works great. But that doesn't happen very often. And when it doesn't, then you have to go adapt it, which is the next question. Um, and I just I recall a time where I'm not going to even mention the funders, uh, but uh, we were. We won this national uh, uh, grant award, and we were forced to choose between three evidence-based curricula of four. But they were so so far from 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 being culturally competent that we had to make another adaptations. And uh, and when you make adaptations, each one of these curricula has to show or tells you which which ones are the core elements. So you can change things around those things, but you cannot change the core elements. And uh, I remember that we changed everything. It didn't look, we we kept the four elements and we did not, I'm not sure where we put them, but uh, we submitted for, for review and it was approved, but it was a completely different uh, curriculum because it did not meet the needs, and we were obliged or required to select one amongst three or four, and it was so rigid that it forced us to change absolutely everything, and whatever we implemented was really, really, really different from, from the original. But I, mean, it, I think... Our clients. 
Um, you know, what I think what Diego's alluding to, and you mentioned, is that very, there are very few evidence-based programs that are designed for the Latino population. And in particular, when there are, you know, they're designed for Latinos on the East Coast or the West Coast of Mexican descent, Puerto Rican. And for the population that, that, that we serve, of uh, Central American, uh, the, the reality of, of their experience, the separation due to immigration, uh, reunification, the multi-generational impact of trauma due to the war, uh, gang violence, all of that has to be taken into account um, in, in a program. And um, a, in addition to the particularities of, of their educational background, limited English proficiency. So those are some of the um, challenges that we've faced, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am hearing, um that your experiences are similar to, you know, what I have understood through my experiences and, and my research as well in this area, that that there is a limitation to those evidence-based programs that have that cultural um, relevance. Um, and it's it's interesting to hear, Diego, you, you mentioning that sometimes it's imposed upon by the funders. That's also a very common uh, aspect to this. And um, I'm curious, when you adapted that program so much so that it no longer even resembled the original program, was your funder uh, okay with that? Yes, we actually had to submit the the adaptation version. They had to review it and approve it. And we were successful. I'm not sure if they did not read it at all, or they understood that in order for us to to really have an impact, we had to change change it so much that uh, that it almost did not resemble anything of the original. Uh, but they did approve it, and it was probably also um, uh, uh, supported by by the data, by the the data that we collect. Um, through focus groups and and you know in the course of of um, implementing the programs too. Oh yes, so we we provided a lot of data to 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 back up all the changes that we made. No, uh, no, the community says they need this. The the this the particular the program does not meet this, so we're proposing to. So we backed every single change that we made to it. I think that's why we were successful. We don't, we didn't just sit at the table and say, we're going to change it this way. We really use our own data to drive our proposed changes. And we do the same with our own programs. No? We, we don't invent things. We really try to match whatever we propose to, to the data. And also then we pilot test it with the community to see if, if we are, if they like it or not, because they, if they don't like whatever intervention we're proposing, we have to change it. So it is, it is not an easy task. It's quite, quite cons uh, time consuming. Right. And it sounds like it's, um, it, the adaptation is, is, uh, iterative that you get information, you make some adaptations, you get more information. Um, I'm curious. So we've, I feel like we've moved on to question two about describing cultural adaptations that you've made to evidence-based programs. I'm wondering if you can, uh, anybody on the panel, if you can highlight a, a concrete example of how you've made an adaptation of a program um, to meet the needs of your families. Of, of an evidence-based program that you're saying? So, okay. I guess, uh, um, for example, um, in one in one of the evidence-based programs um, that that we used back in the day in our conversation, my conversation yesterday with one of our co-founders, um, around the you know building that sense of community among the program participants, how important that is. But again, um, uh, adapting the activities. That so that they would be appropriate for the population that that we are serving, um, the the Street Smart program, Diego. Mm -hmm. um, then the yeah. other, um, I would say, uh, an adaptation that we're um, and and Diego and 
um, and Tomas and Ligia will be speaking to that when we talk specifically about the family reunification, is uh, many of the uh, of our program participants, um, we, we don't want, um, have limited anything that requires a lot of reading, writing. We want everyone to be feel comfortable for, for many reasons. Um, uh, again, due to the uh, reality of the immigration separation situation, many of the youth that we serve may come to us having um, uh, big gaps in their education. So they're not really, they're very smart and savvy and resilient, but they may be uncomfortable with activities that require a lot of reading or writing, et cetera. So we're really um, making sure everything is very experiential um, and that um, folks feel comfortable. And even um, when it comes to uh, uh, surveying their experiences, that everything is designed to, to um, uh, meet them where they are and, and not um, uh, highlight the, the lack perhaps of formal education. So it sounds like a really important piece of the adaptations that you're making is really knowing and understanding um, the folks that you're working with, right? And so you have to have that base. And I really appreciate, uh, Carolina, what you're saying that you do focus groups before you even um, begin to any adaptations because that understanding and some of it is not just cultural. It sounds like, you know, there's education level or literacy issues that um, you all have considered. Sorry, Diego, I cut you off. No, but also, for example, when Egypt takes into consideration the level of trauma that a population has endured compared to others, uh, the, the risk factors that a population faces are different from others. The examples that they have in, in some of the, those programs do not match. We would, we would pilot uh, the, the, the curriculum or the program with the original examples and kids could not relate to any of those things or parents could not relate to. So we had to, had to switch them. We had to uh, eliminate completely some of the risk factors that these programs were alluding to. And we had to insert immigration related issues gang related issues uh, etc so uh, it is it is a, a a deep deep work that gets involved when when you adapt a a program mm -hmm. because if it doesn't make sense to to the uh, if it doesn't resonate with uh, with your target population then it doesn't matter how how well evaluated it was it just People do not connect and, and your program fails. So and folks understand that. And, and some adaptations, as you mentioned at the beginning, are on the surface and others, you have to go really, really deep to the point that you almost, you're almost creating a new program. Right, right. So it can be challenging to make these adaptations for all of those reasons um, that you mentioned. Um, Maybe I want to move us into the next set of questions so that we can bring Lija and Tomas. I know this is where they have a lot more because they are now uh, running this family reunification program as we speak. So um, I know Carolina wanted to provide a little bit of context yeah. as to how this program came to be. And then okay. I know Tomas and Lija can share a lot more about their experiences here. Great. Yeah. Right, so as, as Diego and I have shared um, from the very beginning of identity, uh, family reunification support has been a component of, the, of our programming. And, um, and many times it may be, uh, we're supporting uh, families who are experiencing this um, through individual or family therapy, supporting the families with the uh, uh, case management services, and also uh, different uh, programs that, um, support uh, parent engagement in, in the schools, navigating the schools uh, and, and education and, you know, becoming a, parenting a child that they haven't seen in years. But back in 2014, um, uh, we had a big surge of unaccompanied youth, uh, adolescents coming to our area to be reunited with their family members. And we, we needed to really um, expand uh, the, the services that we could provide both to the youth and to their parents and caregivers. So um, uh, initially we, um, uh, for this program, this multi-session program that 
that we um, developed, we uh, wanted to use a validated instrument to, to measure the um, uh, parent-adolescent communication, which we were seeking to improve. And what we found was um, that that particular survey, the, the questions, the, the language was, was very um, difficult for our participants to understand. So then we, we revamped the, the survey instrument and um, uh, developed a, a survey that used um, different questions from validated instruments to measure communication, uh, relationship, um, uh, ability to manage stress. And then uh, we're working uh, with, with you, Marseille, to further refine these um, instruments to, um, to um, be more culturally competent. And uh, Tomas, and, and I'm sorry, Ligia is gonna share a little bit more about what that looks like, the evaluation in our program. No sé si Tomás quería primero hablar algo de la parte de... ¿No? Exactamente, Ligia, tú. Después en la... Ok. Eh, en este caso, ¿cómo, ¿cómo implementamos en la práctica? De eso vamos a hablar ahorita. So we're going to talk now about how we really implement things in practice. Eh, al inicio, nosotros aplicamos una, una encuesta de base uh, donde levantamos la situación de los indicadores que vamos a darle seguimiento. The first thing we do is we apply a baseline survey with the indicators um, that we're going to give follow-up to. Estos indicadores tienen que ver con cuál es la percepción de los adultos y de los adolescentes respecto a These indicators have to do with the perception of the adults and the adolescents about uh, their perceptions on various things. Eh, la comunicación interpersonal. Interpersonal communication. El nivel de confianza que existe entre ellos. The trust level among them. La calidad de la relación. The quality of the relationship. El conocimiento de los valores familiares. Knowledge of family values. Y las estrategias del manejo del estrés. And stress management strategies. Esto se hace antes para evitar la contaminación durante el proceso, o sea, antes de empezar el proceso de reunificación familiar. So we apply this test before the family reunification process to make sure we don't contaminate results. Al terminar las seis sesiones, se aplica nuevamente este, este instrumento que es parte de la metodología cuantitativa usando siempre las escalas de Likert. At the end of the six sessions, we use this instrument again. Uh, this is a quantitative method using the Lichter scale, and we uh, apply that instrument again as an exit survey. Una adaptación que se hizo fue que pasábamos eh, los el instrumento decía de uno totalmente en desacuerdo hasta cinco totalmente de acuerdo, pero las familias no comprendían a qué se refería eso y tuvimos que ponerlos con sus palabras. One of the adaptations that we made right away is that the scale on the instrument said strongly disagree or strongly agree, and the family really didn't understand what that meant, so we put different words to the scale. Por ejemplo, para decir totalmente de acuerdo, decíamos siempre el joven es cariñoso con usted. For example, to say strongly agree, we might say that the uh, adolescent is always affectionate with you. La última parte de los métodos cuantitativos es la encuesta de satisfacción. The last part of the quantitative methods has to do with a satisfaction survey. Donde se evalúa el contenido y la labor nuestra como facilitadores. Que, ¿Cómo perciben los padres y los adolescentes la labor que hicimos? And that's basically an evaluation, both of the content of the sessions and our work as facilitators. And that's filled out both by the parents and the teenagers. Por último, tenemos los métodos cualitativos que tienen dos partes. Finally, we have the qualitative message, um, methods, which are divided into two parts. Esto nos permite ir construyendo un estudio de caso por familia. So we're able to build a case study for each family. 
Primero hacemos una evaluación de la familia. First, we do an assessment of the family. Donde vemos datos demográficos, pero también hitos positivos y negativos que marcan su situación actual. And we collect demographic information, but we also get information about the major events in their lives, both positive and negative. La segunda parte es sistematizar cada sesión de trabajo con adultos y con adolescentes. And the second part has to do with systematizing each session that we have with the adults and with the adolescents. Eso nos permite poder analizar con los patrones de las percepciones y de los hechos que ellos nos manifiestan en los métodos participativos. And that allows us to analyze the patterns that emerge and the perceptions that people have of both the information and the methodological participation. Gracias. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ligia. So it, it sounds like from what I heard from Carolina and Ligia, both of you, but it just it's you've been very thoughtful <laughs> in planning the steps to develop, implement, and evaluate this program. And what we heard um, just now from Ligia really getting to the point where evaluation is a real important component as they develop and implement this program because, um, you know, it, it, they are, it, it is in pilot phase, I, I believe. Um, and so that evaluation, that assessment, I think you're, what it sounded from Likia's um, comments is that those assessments are really being used to understand uh, what's working, what's not working, what are the patterns that they're seeing um, from these families and, and using that information to improve the program, also the inclusion of the satisfaction survey, doing pre-test and post-test, and even adapting, you know, traditional scales, you know, that Likert one through five scale doesn't always work, it sounds like, for the families that they're working with. So th those are just some of the important highlights of what I heard um, in response to that question. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I'll move us into this um, final question that I have for the panel about what are the biggest challenges then to validating practice-based programs? Because, you know, as we've heard, it, it, it's labor intensive, it takes time. Um, so what are some of those biggest challenges and how have you overcome them? Jose Tomás, si quieres empezar. Bueno, podríamos mencionar, digamos, como cuatro grandes áreas en donde se nos presentan retos para poder eh, desarrollar el programa. La primera es las adaptaciones que se tienen que hacer en las dinámicas de cada grupo. Cada grupo es diferente. En... So there are four main areas in which we're finding challenges in the program. The first is that you have to adapt the program to the group, and each group is different. Este... En español nosotros decimos que es un programa vivo. No sé si hay una traducción en inglés. In Spanish we say that it's a programa vivo, and maybe the translation in English would be that it's a living program. Este, o sea que tiene su dinamismo propio. Hay un diseño general, pero lo vamos adaptando a cada grupo, este, de acuerdo a la observación que vamos haciendo, como mencionaba Ligia de la sistematización de cada una de las reuniones. So each uh, group has its own dynamics. There's a general design, but you have to adapt that design according to the observations that you're making, as Ligia said, during the systematization of the program. Eh, luego tenemos que un gran reto es la adaptación de las simbologías que utilizamos en, la, en cada una de las sesiones. And one of the challenges is to adapt the symbols that are used in each of the sessions. El, nosotros usamos una serie de simbologías como es el árbol de la vida, en donde las personas hacen una, una narración del proceso de, de migración y de reunificación familiar. 
One of the uh, symbols that we use is the tree of life, and that's where people are able to tell the story of their lives in terms of the, their migration and the family reunification that happened. Entonces tenemos que ver que estos símbolos en realidad estén adaptados culturalmente a las familias. The symbols have to be culturally adapted to the family. Por eso eh, muchos están relacionados con fenómenos naturales o con contextos familiares. So a lot of the symbols come from nature or from family context. Eh, muchos de nuestros participantes provienen de áreas rurales y los fenómenos naturales les dicen mucho. A lot of our participants come from rural areas, so symbols that come from nature mean a lot to them. Este, el tercer reto es el trabajo que tenemos que hacer con personas analfabeta. The third area of challenge is working with people who are not literate. El, el programa básicamente en cada taller da una atención personalizada, por eso siempre estamos un facilitador y un co-facilitador que va eh, atendiendo a cada una de las personas en el proceso de la reunión. In the uh, workshop process, we try to give personalized attention, which is why we always have two people. We have the facilitator and the co-facilitator, so that we can try to give individualized attention to what's coming up in the group. Y estas dinámicas personales se profundizan aún más en las sesiones de coaching que tenemos con las familias. And these personal dynamics can, we can go into them more deeply in the individualized coaching sessions that we have with the families. El, eh, el cuarto reto que tenemos es, como mencionaba Ligia, la evaluación misma, o sea, cómo poder evaluar, y el reto está en dos sentidos. Uno, que sea de, de forma comprensible para los participantes, so the fourth area of challenge has to do with the evaluation itself, as Ligia was saying. Um, one of the areas of challenge there is that the evaluation needs to be understandable to the participants. Y el segundo, que la metodología permita medir realmente los objetivos que pretendemos del programa. And the second uh, challenge is that the methodology allows actual measurement of the objectives of the program. Something I would add to what Tomas is sharing about like the practical challenges to validating a practice-based program is at the other level is actually finding funding. Finding funding that allows you to invest in the time that it takes to plan in order to validate a practice-based program. And as Diego was sharing in our experience and being able to um, um, uh, do focus groups, gather data. So when we um, developed uh, one of our high school uh, core curricula, we had a one year of a planning grant, and that was really essential to to the development of, of a um, uh, uh, to validating a practice based program. So I think um, this is a process that we've been sharing, and it takes time, and it um, and it's finding the funding to give you the time to do that. Anything on, else? On the other there? hand. But on the other hand, if you, if you, we really want to reach a population, we have to do it anyway. So we had, sometimes we had money, sometimes we did not have any money. So we had to make it do with whatever we had. Uh, one of the advantages for us is that we have and continue to invest a lot of resources in evaluation. So we don't need to sometimes do extra effort you know, with, the, with the baseline service that we do and with the regular um, uh, uh, interactions with the clients, it allows us to move processes forward. But, but the alternative is not doing it. And then if you're not doing it, then it's a hit or miss. And, and that's quite dangerous too. Right. How do you go, so what, one of the challenges that I'm hearing is you can't afford not to do it, but sometimes the, the funding, as Carolina mentioned, is a real thing, especially for some organizations. Um, 
where do you look for funding when you need to for um, to meet this challenge? <laughs> well, we we have been fortunate, but also we've worked very hard to make the case that programs such as the one that we're describing today are are needed and to also when you submit the application you need to make the case that that programs like this are very rare they don't exist you need to justify the need no so that it is about how many families are here that are reuniting what are the consequences for example when we write about that we talk about the consequences that we see and we have documented no uh, one of the ones that that two of the strongest ones that get people's attentions is the rise in gangs because when when particularly young men do not uh, do not complete the reunification process well they become very easy praise to gangs such as ms13 and we have heard uh, an uptick in in murders and uh, from ms and uh, so and for girls what we see is that they tend to leave the home and to and to basically go to live with older men. So when you are able to justify the need for the program, then it's easier for us to, to ask for money uh, in order to do uh, um, to do the the evaluation that you need to undertake to make sure that you are developing something that will meet the needs of your clients. And we do it with government, we do it with foundations. Uh, if we, if you are lucky and you work hard and lucky, you can get a federal grant. These days it's impossible. Uh, but before, uh, and, and some foundations and uh, government grants allow for a planning grant. Mm -hmm. uh, but even if you have a planning grant, doesn't mean that you're set. You have to continue to evaluate it, to tweak the different programs. Um, what, what helped us the most, I would say, is to incorporate evaluation as a core element of the organization. So it's, it's built into our DNA and also uh, into all of the positions, uh, into our indirect, et cetera. So that gives us some flexibility to do things in-house without need for additional funding. We could do it better with additional funding, but if we have to, then we do without. And there's vo volunteers, there's uh, uh, evaluators, scientists who who might be aligned with what you want to accomplish, who who love the idea, who love the project, and who can publish afterwards. So so you have to look at other ways, not just money, but there's a lot of in kind support that you can get from people that really value the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And I love hearing that as an organization, you you recognize the importance of evaluation, um, so that it's built into and in, into your normal business, <laughs> which is great. But um, you know, I don't know that that always happens. So I love that I hear you saying that because it is important. Um, and so the you know, it's great. I I heard that evaluation is a must, whether or not. Um, you can find additional funding for it. it, it's imperative. And then the other thing I heard from the earlier set of questions too is that cultural adaptations are necessary. Again, whether or not you have additional funding or not, it seems like making those adaptations are crucial, right? Um, so, so thanks. I actually wanna move us into the uh, audience questions because I know we're running short on time and I wanna make sure we hear some, some things from the audience. Yeah, thank you, um, <clears throat> Marcia. The the audience has been really excited by the topic and, and really enjoys hearing about what you all have to say. And I think the thing that's coming out the most is uh, if if maybe Tomas and, and Ligia uh, or, or, or any of the panelists can really share a bit more of the, the details, maybe a, a good story or example of a specific variable they may have had to change in their programs uh, you know sense of community has come up um, you know moving away from writing uh, and 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 those types of activities has kind of come up but just there's any specific concrete examples that would be good to share yeah i'll i'll, I'll let uh, 
I can set it up, uh, maybe perhaps uh, uh, set up this uh, question uh, for Tomas to share. One of the objectives of the um, uh, of our of our program of our our funding for this program was to reestablish parental authority, restablecer la autoridad de los padres, and how we through our um, providing activities that the families could do together, our virtual activities, how um, we were able to um, um, develop an activity that got us to that objective, perhaps in a different way. Um, Tomas, can you share a little bit about the virtual sessions that promoted using the everyday activities that families um, have um, to accomplish, preparing a meal, uh, organizing for chores? Do you want to give that example? Eh, cuando se da el COVID, nosotros tuvimos que adaptar todo el plan a unas sesiones virtuales que básicamente son actividades que las familias tienen que realizar en su casa. So when COVID uh, broke out, we had to adapt our entire plan, of course, and we ended up with virtual sessions with activities that the families could do at home. Entonces, estas actividades son las que hace normalmente cualquier familia en su casa, como cocinar, arreglar la casa, ver una película o jugar. So these are normal activities, everyday life, cooking, uh, cleaning up the house, maybe watching a movie or playing. Este, pero hay un cambio, digamos, en la dinámica. El cambio es que ellos tienen que conversar sobre cada una de las actividades. But the change in dynamic is this, that they are asked to talk about each one of the activities. Este, empezando desde la planeación, que, por ejemplo, qué vamos a cocinar, qué platillo vamos a cocinar, Este, y se les orienta que, por ejemplo, si pueden hacer un plato típico de sus países, mejor. So, starting from the planning. So, if it's about cooking, then, okay, what are we going to cook? And we encourage the, them to cook something that's a typical dish from their, from their country. Y luego, ¿cómo se sintieron hacer las actividades juntos? Porque nos damos cuenta de que estas actividades se han vuelto individualizadas. Cada uno, por ejemplo, ve su, una película separada del, del otro, especialmente ahora que hay este, las servicios de stream. And it goes all the way to how did you feel about doing this activity together? Because um, what happens a lot now is that everybody does their own activities individually, even watching your own movie now that it's uh, all the streaming is possible. Y entonces hacer una actividad colectivo, sentirse parte de la familia, eso es lo que eh, se ha desarrollado con estas actividades y las Eh, familias en la retroalimentación que nos dan semana a semana nos han dicho de que hay cambios importantes, que hay más comunicación, que hay más participación en las actividades eh, diarias de la familia. And so we're really encouraging collective action and helping people to feel part of the family by doing things together. And in the feedback that we collect from the family members every week, we're hearing that important changes are happening, that uh, people are communicating more with each other, that there's more participation in daily activities. Y por último, estas actividades también han facilitado el compartir las emociones. O sea, no solo el pensamiento, sino la emoción de, de y poderse mostrar afecto, cariño, que es tal vez el elemento eh, fundamental para la reunificación. And the other thing that um, we've really worked on a lot is sharing emotions, not just talking about what we think, but also about how we feel. And um, being able to get to a point where you can show affection for one another, and that's been fundamental for our family reunification process. So I just a quick one, not, not just in terms of the, the cultural piece, but also how or when the, these programs are implemented. I remember that we were mandated to implement a program that was uh, every other week, 
and because of the uncertainty of the lives of the clients that we serve by the end of week eight the dropout was quite high so we shifted and we implemented in the retreat mode and suddenly we had a hundred percent complete uh, com completeness complete attendance and the contact monitors could not believe that that could be achieved so you can adapt it in many different ways not just the cultural piece uh, which is extremely important but also how it's implemented when it's implemented where it's implemented all those things makes it part of you being culturally competent and diego in that example do you feel that it's still the same program even with those kinds of adaptations or do you feel like now it's become a different program well it met, it met the objectives and it met the needs. That was important. Um, we used the, the, the curricula was the same, but if you're working with a population that is dealing with tremendous amount of barriers, uh, then you have to do what you have to do to make sure that you deliver uh, the program that you believe is best for them. And the best mode in that particular case was on a retreat mode. And uh, Again, it was it went from being a failing program to being the most successful amongst its its peers, no, uh, across the nation in terms of attendance and com and com people completing 100% of the sessions. We were actually called to the CDC to go talk about it. So, I think it, we met the objectives. <laughs> That's great. Okay, great. Any other examples? Um or any final comments uh, that we didn't get to? I'll give you one example that used to be an older version when we did not have the reunification program. We, we, had, we had to create a session. One of the biggest challenges with, with our families is that they, when they rene renewify, renew, reunify, they do not talk. When, when Tomas is talking about sharing conversation, but also sharing emotions, those things don't happen. I don't know how much attendees know, but these young people come here and usually there's no conversation about what happened in the home country. The kids don't know why they were left behind. The economic hardships or whatever other hardships the father or the mother had to endure. So we used to do a, a, an activity to address that because the, the children used to blame the parents for having left them and the parents were never able to tell their story because it was not in their, DNA to tell the story. They were not very communicative. They didn't understand the power of sharing why they left in order to allow the children to heal. And we did a, an activity where, where we had the parents and the kids together and the parents for the first time would tell their children and other children why they had to leave and how difficult it was for them. And at the end of the, the session, the parents were asked to stand in line and they were blindfolded. And, and kids were all over them. And when we took the blinds off, everyone had a cape and a big S on the chest for a super dad or super mom for everything that they had endured. So that is a concrete activity, uh, example of an activity that, that we, we, we used in order to meet a very specific purpose for the parents to tell the story and to provide a, the children an opportunity to acknowledge even for the first time, the tremendous sacrifice that the parents had done to leave the pain but also to allow them to bring them back and provide them with a better future so it did not heal everything but it was a start upon which the relationship could be built uh, like uh, using the techniques that we use the examples that Lee and Tomas gave mm -hmm. that's a very powerful uh, example of an activity and I love I love that you were able to share all of you examples of what you've done what you're doing, and I'm sure what you will continue to do to support the families that you serve. And I hope that that serves to our listeners as well as just recognizing the strength and the power um, of this practice-based experience, because you all have been doing this for 20, more than 20 years, um, and you have a lot to bring to the table. Um, and so thank you all for sharing. Thank you for being here today. I, I hope this was a good conversation for everyone. Um, before I mention the slide, before people sign off, um, we, are, we have an evaluation. So um, in the spirit of what you heard today, please complete our evaluation after this webinar. And then um, as a last 
uh, thing here is just uh, wanting to let you all know that we have our final webinar of the series next week. Um, it's around equity and justice for black communities post COVID-19. This is a, a conversation with grassroots um, folks. So please uh, plan on attending that. And there's some information about how that you can get more questions in and keep the conversation alive. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining today. Thank you very Thank you much, Marseille. Thank Thanks for asking. Thank you to Community Science for inviting yeah. us.